Raphael, I haven't talked to you in a while. How are, how are things? How is Weird West going? Things are good. Uh, we, uh, you know, we're, we're about to announce actually the ship date of the game very soon. Uh, it's, it's been a, it's been a hard game to, to develop, but, um, I think, I think the result will be, will be there. Have you ever had an easy game to develop? I feel like hard game to develop is, <laughs> is like redundant. You know, in a strange way, I would say, uh, I would say Dishonored 1 was pretty smooth. Prey was, was pretty, pretty smooth as well. I mean, you know, smooth is huh. related. Right. There's always uh, there's always some some hiccups and and some tough tough moments. But I, in in retro, you know, compared to say Dark Messiah or Arx Fatalis, uh, those games will really help uh, to develop. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, I guess some of it is you know the, the team was more mature. We did not have to worry so much. Ah, you know, it, the reality is that we forget. <laughs> we, we forget. We forget how big, horrible yeah. it was. It's all hard. Is. You just forgot about it. You right? put it in the past. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like exes. You know, we always forget. <laughs> but we you know what? Both, the the thing about both of those, I feel like with both Dishonored and Prey, the vision was so strong that I imagine that made a big difference. Like with a new IP, there's so many different like ways you can go, and like sometimes not everyone on the team understands what the game actually is. But those two games, I feel like, just have a very set, especially Prey, because you could be like, "Hey, this is System Shock spiritual successor." Um, but with the, yeah, I feel like a strong vision makes a big difference. And obviously, Harvey Smith is a is a great talent, um, as are many of the other people at Hurricane, yourself included, Raphael. Thank you, Jason. Welcome to the episode number seven of the House of the Dev podcast. I'm your co-host Peter Salnikov. We've got Raphael Calantonio from Austin, Texas. Hi, Raph. Hello. And this time, as usual, we've got a very special guest, reporter for Kotaku and Bloomberg, the author of the books Blood, Sweat and Pixels and brand new Press Reset. This is Jason Schreier. Hi, and thanks for joining us. Hello. Thanks for having me, guys. You are entering the house of the dead. So this time we're going to discuss the relations between the devs and the press. This is a pretty hot topic which can be very sensitive. You know, there's a lot of problems in this and I think that this time we have to describe who are the modern day journalists, how do you communicate with them and how not to fail while doing that. Especially if you are a humble team with a small game. There's no huge publisher like Microsoft or PlayStation behind you. So yeah, let's do this, guys. Sure, sounds good. I think that we can even compare journalists from the US and Russia because I think there's a big difference. I mean, we had a... um, I think I can call it a small scandal a couple of weeks before this podcast. And I saw two points in it. First of all, modern day journalists often do not understand their role in the industry. They kind of do not want to dig in, they do not want to learn more about the games, about how they are really being made. And the devs do not want to share it because they don't think that the press must know this. Well, in my opinion, if you love something, then, well, you have to dig in, you have to learn more about it and explore. I mean, I've been working with entertainment media and especially video game media for more than a decade before I became a dev myself. And um, I mean, making this podcast with Raf is the result of my love for video games. That's point number one. So what do you think, Jason? And can you relate, Raphael? Um, oh yeah, I can relate, but I will, I will let Jason. Well, so to what do I think of the relationship between journalists and developers? What what specifically are you curious about? I mean, if you are a small team with a humble game, how do you attract the interest of the press? Because, well, if you are making a AAA game, things are pretty automatic, if I may say so. The publisher does everything for you. Well, maybe not everything, but... The publisher does very much. At least they send away the review keys and then you just enjoy your reviews, articles or YouTube, whatever. Maybe you have a really interesting game. Maybe it's a revolutionary game. 
but the schedule of the journalist is packed with so many big games that they're not really into smaller projects. How do you drive attention of a huge outlet in that case? Yeah, well, I mean, I actually think there is some interest among journalists for, for smaller projects. I think a lot of people are interested in things that are new, things that are doing completely um, genuinely new things with the medium, innovative things. Um, some of my favorite games in recent years are like Outer Wilds and Return of the Obra Dinn and Baba is You. And those are all indie games that just did completely revolutionary things, things I hadn't seen before in games, which is super cool for me personally. Um, to me, I think that there are two ways to stand out. One is is that one is to make a game that just like immediately hooks me and makes me want to play it um, which is very much my tailored has to be tailored to my taste so that's that's not something that everyone can do necessarily but the second thing that will catch my eye personally as a journalist is just having a really good story behind your game and if you come to me and you say hey we made a game I might be way less interested than if you come to me and say hey we escaped from North Korea and this is the game we made about our experience experiences there or like here is the story of how I locked myself in an attic for for 10 years to make my dream game or whatever else if, if it's a really compelling story that to me is is the best way to get my attention at least I don't know if it's a tangent or not but uh, you were you were asking how I relate to all of that uh, and to me first of all it's hard to put every journalist in the journalist bubble because I think there's different approaches and uh, and different passion per journalist, right? Um, on, on my end, I think it's most of all nowadays because of reviews are usually now like there's so many user reviews, there's so many uh, random blogs, random YouTuber, YouTubers, etc. That the review part is not that interesting to me as much as the, where journalists can make the difference to me is when they can get in contact with the developer and either provide an interesting interview not necessarily about the game like how many levels do you have how many, how many weapons do you have you know but more like uh things that i could not know basically as a player i'm saying you know i i, I think i think that's what interests me is like the story behind the people why are they making what they're making uh what drives them and uh you know that's the main uh thing for me like Reviews, they, they matter for another reason that I'm, I'm dying to talk about later. Uh, and uh, and then the other approach was, you know, Jason and, ha and I have talked about in the past, you know. Uh, I think the, the, the part that I'm least interested in and is kind of, kind of damaging to the industry is trying to get the, the, the crunchy story behind the scenes that is ultimately going to be rumors and damaging to to the industry, to, to the to the actors of, of this industry, you know, uh, and that's the part that I like the least because I don't think video games are. I don't think video game actors owe anything to people. It's like we're not the government. We're not hiding the existence of aliens to people. We are a business. Uh, if we are hiding anything, usually it's because marketing reasons or to make a to make an announcement that is going to be more impactful. Or maybe there are some licensing deals that are happening. Uh, so any, uh, you know, anyone who, who thinks that they're a, a, a whistleblower in the in the game industry, I find it usually more damaging than than in anything. You know? I get it that people like secrets; they like to know what's oh, you know, there's a rumor that they're working on this or whatever. But ultimately, it's you know, it's it's not it's not helping anyone, I believe, uh, and I don't see much value in that. But that's you know that's my that's my thing about journalists. Uh, I've I've had some amazing positive uh, interactions with journalists. I've had some rough ones that have been difficult in, in many ways. They have a lot of power, have a lot of power, uh, and that's that's definitely an interesting party in the uh, ecosystem of the game industry. So in the first part of your speech. You are saying that the person has to have a desire to reach out, to explore and know more about your project. I mean, Jason, can you describe the mission of a journalist these days? How do you see it? Because a lot of people still think that the goal of the journalist is to, you know, to tell their audience if the game is crap or it's good, and that's it. 
Yeah, I mean, they're right. They're like Raf said. It's hard to really just talk about this in general terms because there's so many different types of journalists and reporters doing so many different types of things. There's some people at major gaming websites whose job is just to write reviews. There's some people whose job is just to write guides for games and and tell people how to get get through games and how to find secrets and stuff. And is that even journalism? Uh, it's it's a type it's certainly producing content that helps the website survive and that alone is is important um and if you i mean that's that's a whole nother big conversation about systemic yeah. issues and how websites can only survive because of google and what people are googling and other uh, the lack of money in media is an entirely different conversation yeah. topic um but i mean i see the job of a reporter um which is a little bit different than a reviewer although the two can intersect but the job of a reporter is to to uh give people information to tell people the truth and tell people the 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 give people information in a fair accurate hopefully entertaining honest way um that fundamentally is the job um and sometimes that's at odds with people like raf because sometimes information is sometimes a reporter gets information that a developer doesn't necessarily want them to know. Um, and to Raph's point about whistleblowers, I think, Raphael, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt and assume that you're just talking about whistleblowers when it comes to leaking unannounced games as opposed to whistleblowers when it comes to talking about sexual harassment and cultural oh, issues. Absolutely, yeah. No, yeah. Of okay. course. No, I'm talking yeah, about anything that is business or business uh, uh, that has impact on business, like, yeah, uh, yeah. announcing a leaked yeah. game or leaked documents about a game or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I think that that there are lots of complicated reasons why someone might feel compelled to share that sort of thing. And um, for the reporter, it's a little less complicated because it's a reporter's job. If there's a story that they find out, it's a reporter's job to tell that story. If a reporter were to sit on a story that was newsworthy and interesting and true and, and accurate um, just for the sake of like marketing, then they wouldn't be a reporter. They would be a marketer, right? So um, I think there are different levels and different journalists have different definitions of what newsworthy is like for example if someone tells me that um next year activision is making a new call of duty game and it's set in in i don't know world war ii whatever it is i wouldn't be like that's necessarily that wouldn't necessarily be newsworthy um i saw headlines today for example that people are reporting that the next dragon age will be next gen only and not cross gen which kind of i i saw those headlines and raised an eyebrow I was like, wait a minute, what? It's like three years from now. Of course it's going to be next gen. How is that a story? Um, Whereas um, in other cases, I think if there's kind of a deeper story or if the story like shed some light on some some aspects of the industry that would otherwise go untold, or if there is really just, if, if it's a compelling piece of information that it's really, that the journalist feels like it's worth telling readers, then it's the reporter's job to tell that story, to make sure it's fair and accurate um, and truthful, but to get that story out there. Um, and I don't really think that, um, fundamentally, I, I think that as a reporter, something that I always have to consider, something that is always a factor is like, who is this going to hurt? Is this going to hurt the developers? Is this going, is this going to hurt the people who are involved in the making in, in this story? But that can't be the only factor. And sometimes a reporter's job is to tell the story, even knowing that it might hurt people, um, because it's the, the it's a reporter's job to tell the truth and to get that information out there. Oh, yes, yeah, so it's a matter of work ethic and also judgment. And, and some of it is uh, arbitrary. But, um, you know, in, in let, me, let me tell you what's an example of something that a reporter uh, might not even realize that happened, right? Like when when someone would learn that our concept for our concept for uh, for prey, for example, is based on uh, an homage to System Shock, right? And and they find this PowerPoint and it says this is System Shock three, for example, right? It sounds where like a little thing. Can you possibly think of that example? I, I don't know where it came yeah, from. Yeah, that, no that sounds like a small thing, right? It's, it sounds <laughs> like, well, you know, the public would like to know that. Why not? That's fun. Let's do it, right? What you don't know is that at the same time, we are trying to negotiate the, the, the IP, right? With the owner of this IP. And as they see the news, suddenly it changes the business entirely. They go, oh, 
That's yeah, Raf. Happening. Well, and so this is where we get into interesting territory because talking specifically about that story. So it got a little bit of background for people who might not know. So in May of 2013, I, while well, I was at Kotaku, published a story that Arcane was making Prey. Um, uh, I think it was it was like it was newsworthy because there was this game called Prey Two that had been announced by Human Head Studios, and that was in in it was ambiguous. It was like in development hell. Nobody knew where it was, and so it was news worthy that suddenly the Prey license had been moved to Arcane. And what happened was over the summer, um, Pete Hines and Raphael um, were asked about it and essentially um, were were not quite candid, um, especially Pete's comments. Pete Hines is the, the head of PR at Bethesda. Essentially said, no, that's not true. And a bunch of outlets ran stories saying, oh, Kotaku was wrong. That's not true. Um, and then what happened was we published uh, a couple of emails saying, hey, uh, from our, from RAF saying, hey, we're making Prey. And one of them mentioned System Shock 3. Um, what happened over the course of that reporting process was that um, PR at Bethesda was not particularly friendly or helpful or or um, forthcoming with the truth, as as we saw in public interviews. They their interest was was hiding the truth because their belief was that um, I mean, there's generally a belief from a lot of PR people that the press are their marketing arms and that the press should just should just do what they want, right? So um, at that point. To your point, Raphael, I think as the reporter, if you or if Pete or if anyone on the Bethesda team had said to me, hey, Jason, like this would actually really harm us because we're in negotiations to do blah, blah, blah. So please don't print this. I would have said, totally. well, OK, I understand your point. Maybe we can do something on the record where you you tell you give me your side of the story on the record. And you know what? Maybe we'll wait a couple of months and maybe we don't have to print this right now, but we can do it in the future. If you say to me, OK, yes, I will give you an on the record interview because this wasn't the type of thing that I felt like, oh, my God, like this has to be exposed right now that Prey is 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 inspired by System Shock. Um, I felt compelled to publish those emails and to prove that Arcane was making Prey because you guys had called me a liar in public. You guys had said Kotaku is like, I don't know where that rumor came from was the exact quote. Like the Prey, you, uh, yeah. Arcane is not making oh, Prey the- yeah, that was poorly handled by PR on our side for sure. Right. Well, so uh, so my point, Raphael, my point is that if, if when developers feel like if you were to feel like, hey, this journalist doesn't really know what's going on, like he he's missing info behind the scenes, the solution to that isn't to just like say we decline to comment, we have we do not comment on rumor and speculation. The solution yeah. to that is say, hey, Jason, let's talk off the record. Here's totally. what's happening. And you and I, Here's what we yeah, can. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we can work together and tell a story about all this because I personally would rather tell the full story about everything than I would just like tell only one side of the story. You know what I mean? Yeah, and you and I talked about it already in the past. Uh, mm-hmm. we, you know, we had a head to head, which was uh, which was yeah, good. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and uh, how to heart? Sorry, uh, but but the thing is, um, there there were more to this, right? It was a complicated situation because. Frankly, even during the development of Prey, once we were signed off as Prey, we were still battling to not be Prey. You know, that's the, that's the part that people don't know. So mm-hmm. when it was out in the open that we're doing Prey, there was way more. Like Again, like you look at the world from your perspective and that's great. There's going to be a cool story. I'm going to prove that I'm right. Fuck them because they're trying to send a liar. That's all great. But meanwhile, there's like a full organization that is... Because of that being poorly handled, I, I granted that, right? You know, I, I give you that. That PR should have said, like, Raf, you can't... Because I tried to talk to you, you know, and PR was like, yeah. absolutely not. You know, we don't, we don't negotiate with a terrorist. That was the little insider joke like there. Mm-hmm. And, and I was like, no, yeah. I want to talk to him. I'm going to tell him he's, he's a human being. He's, he's going to understand. But they, they did not want that. And I, I, I resent that, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll agree. But the point is... Meanwhile, there were way more behind. Like we, we did not want to. Be, we did not want to be prey. We were still negotiating with the chairman to not be prey. To be, you know, we came up with some different names, etc. So it being in the in the open, oh, these guys are making prey. Cool. You know, now like all the popul- all the all the people outside are all excited or, or angry or whatever for the wrong reasons at the end of the day because maybe we would have managed to get out of this of this name right we did not want the name it was like you know i've said it many, many times since because back then yes i was <laughs> playing the game i was like oh yeah it's a good name you know it's a first person shooter but, you know when you're part of a big corporation like that you have to to play the game to some degree you know 
But uh, of course, no, it's not a good game for the game. Uh, you know, it was it was bad for for the for the developers who made the original Prey. It was bad for us. We, we suddenly we we were like a sequel to a game that we were not making a sequel for, and it was bad for, bad for the gamers. You know, the gamers had the wrong game. Like they they you know hopefully they still had a good game, but they did not have the game they thought they would get. You know, so it was just like. And it was wrong for Bethesda because they didn't make the sales they should have, you know, if, if they had a, the, the appropriate name. So it was just a plain wrong decision. We all agree on that. Um, but anyway, it's... <laughs> sorry if I sound a little charged. And again, you and I have cleared the air since, so we, we got it. But my point is, to me, even if I'm not the victim of that, of that situation, I do not think that this is really interesting... Uh, and that's my take on it. And, you know, you might have a different op- opinion. It's like, yeah, I think it's great. Those crunchy news are fantastic. It's all like, which is, it's more like creating drama. And like, he says, she said, you know, like the same thing between humanity and us. Like, oh yeah, they, Arcane came in and they killed humanity. And, you know, they, they stabbed them in the heart and got, robbed their IP. And like, even to this day, I cannot undo those legends, you know, because of this kind of journalism, which is like, oh, let's let's try to make a story with like two threads that we have or something, right? And uh, and that is something that I don't think is very helpful in general. It might it might generate clicks. It might be interesting to some people. They might like the drama of it, but at the end of the day, it's it's more harmful than it's it's it helps. I think unlike. You know the other type that I'm not going to name either, like specific journalists or, or blog, but they are like more documentary oriented, and they will say things that are pretty crunchy and interesting too. But at least, you know, without generating drama, which which at the end of the day, the human head story, human head arcane story, I can tell you, nobody understands it. It's a, it's right now like the state of of the forums are just wrong about it. Yeah, yeah, I, I think it's it's. I made this point earlier, but none of that would have happened if there hadn't been denial of what we reported, right? Like, cause, cause it was, it was a lot of, it was all of that drama really. Like if, if the Bethesda PR team had just said, oh, we're not going to comment on that, then it, totally, that, yeah. it wouldn't, would have never happened because the original story was just, Hey, this is what we hear, which is something that at Kotaku we do all the time. We did all the time was, was report on things that we thought were interesting that we heard or rumors that we heard. Um, uh, it could have just been left at that. I'll just leave it. I'll leave it there. Um, yeah. So, uh, well, first of all, guys, this is a wonderful material. Yeah, yeah, Thank you. Totally. No, I agree with all that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we don't want to make all of this between uh, uh, you know about this, right? So it's just uh, it's it's yeah, it's an interesting opportunity since it's we haven't talked in two years. Yeah, yeah, Jason. So the the games that you have mentioned earlier, like the Baba is you. Uh, I got more. Wait until we talk about uh, Metacritic. These are, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, those games are. Uh, I don't know how the story started, but uh, I saw those games. Uh, I mean, yeah, I understand that these are indie games for smaller teams. Uh, but uh, like every, at some point, every outlet talked about them. Uh, we are right now in the middle of uh, a contest. Uh, for the devs on uh, Unreal Engine 4. And uh, these are even smaller and even more humble, sometimes not very humble games. I mean, there there are some ambitious projects on their way. But, I mean, uh, these guys, they have... Uh, uh, they will have a lot of struggle uh, without a publisher to, to gain attention of the press. So uh, if a guy like this just writes you an email and says, we are making an RPG, there's no compelling, heartbreaking story behind it. It's just a nice RPG in our original setting, etc., etc. How do you actually, uh, I mean, how do you, first of all, as a journalist, how do you manage your time to, you know, the, the devs should also understand that the journalist has his job to do. He has his schedule and you must fit in. So how do you actually find it the uh, the time how do you proceed with the uh, with an email like like that yeah, well, so a couple of things. First of all, it depends on the time of year. There's some times of year, and really it's just random because some so there's some weeks when I'm just like, oh my God, I have so many games to play right now. And then there are other times when it's like, oh, I have some time to check out something new. Um, my schedule is very um, different now than it was when I was at Kotaku, actually. Now I'm at Bloomberg. Um, 
when I was at Kotaku, I had a lot more flexibility to be like, hey, I just played a game and now I'm going to write some short blog post about it and my thoughts on it. Um, now at Bloomberg, we don't do that sort of thing. And I'm more focused on reporting and making phone calls and, and less time. I spend a lot less time playing games for work. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's harder to get my attention with like a smaller game because I don't have room to write about it as much. Um, there is there is some time like I, I found some time to finish The Forgotten City, which everyone was raving about. Um, but oftentimes I personally, my personal approach, since I'm less of a reviewer and more of a reporter, my personal approach is to um play what I'm seeing other people or friends buzz about. That's where I get a lot of just like normal people, non-journalists. I get a lot of my recommendations from just like group texts or friends or word of mouth. Um, If I see everybody buzzing about a game like The Forgotten City, which I mentioned, which was amazing, um, then I will probably check it out, especially if it's a game that seems up my alley personal. Like I I have personal tastes. I'm really into games that have like intriguing stories or like that do interesting things that that I haven't seen before with mechanics. and uh, yeah, so so if someone emailed me to answer your question, if someone emailed me and said, hey, I have this cool RPG that you should check out, I would look at it. I would see if it's up my alley. If it's up my alley, it would really depend how much time I have um, and how many other games I'm playing. Uh, like right now, I'm so I have too many more games than I have time to play. But if you caught me in like, I don't know, a slower season, um, July or something, typically when it's a little bit slower, then maybe I would have time to play it if I thought it was interesting. And then uh, and then I would just see I would give it a chance. Um, if I thought it looked cool, I would give it a chance. The problem is just that my inbox is always full of games and they're just way more games every single year. Um, it's just more and more games. It's like that. That is one of the biggest problems in the video game industry right now. It's just the glut like the overwhelming number of games and we've seen i mean they're more they're also more gamers than ever before but still it's so hard to stand out um and especially when you're battling all these other amazing games for people's attention um it's tough if it's like a first time developer then that also makes it really tough because i don't have any frame of reference if it's someone like like Raphael, where he has this track record of like making amazing games, then I might be more inclined to be like, okay, like I know this will be worth my time if I check it out. Um, for a first time developer, like I want to give people the chance um, and the benefit of the doubt. So it feels like you have to make it as easy as possible for, for me to want to play your game. Like send, send a trailer, make it really quick and snappy, send a couple of screenshots, like make, make me interested right away, send a very short pitch. Um, make me really want to play it um, immediately, um, which is easier said than done. Like I don't envy anyone who who is in that position these days. It's really really tough, um, and I I like always feel bad because there are more cool games in my inbox than than there is time to play them all. Yeah, this really sucks, and it sucks to to say no every time. Every time it's yep. not not my cup of tea, or I don't have time. You have to understand this. This really this breaks my heart every time because uh, I mean, often people want specifically you to look at their game. They do not just want to you know have a review on your outlet or some sort of live stream with uh, you know random hosts. They want your attention they want your opinion uh i mean not uh, specifically uh a review or something maybe just an opinion maybe just uh you know a cool advice or something and you go just like fellas really so sorry this is uh, i feel bad about it but i have to you know decline that's sad that's the saddest part of the job i think so another thing uh, I wanted to talk to, be, uh, to you about, Jason, uh, is that uh, is that thing that you have been discussing with uh, Raf uh, the uh, the negotiation uh, process. Uh, is there a line between you know uh, doing your job and uh, negotiating with the with the publisher, even if it's an, uh, a huge publisher or a humble indie publisher, doesn't matter. Is there some kind of, you know, codex for you? Yeah, I mean, negotiation, uh, I assume you're talking about like, hey, I'll wait to publish the story yeah, if you do yeah, such course. and such, like yeah. that sort of negotiation. Yeah, that doesn't happen often. Um, most game publishers are, are their PR people. Like I said, they just uh, uh, see press as marketing extension. So they're not even going to have a conversation with you. They're just going to say, we decline to comment um, or just ignore your, com- your request for comment. 
Um, I would only consider that. So I would never consider any sort of negotiation if it was a story about wrongdoing, if it was a story about someone doing something wrong, if it was a story about cultural issues, if it was a story about uh, many of the things that I've written about behind the scenes, game development stories, issues, how a game fell apart, um, behind the scenes issues, conflicts and crunch and um, harassment and abuse like none of that stuff is ever like something I would say okay we'll we'll wait on this story if you do this um, uh, that's not to say like like sometimes uh, I'll request comment from a PR person and they'll say hey can you give us till Wednesday instead of Tuesday like that that can be fine um, if we're not in a rush to get a story up we'll be like fine we want to get your side of the story in there that's that's fine um, but we're not going to be like we're going to sit on this story what I'm talking about is more and I don't even think this has ever happened to me but it's something I would be open to if I had a story like the Arcane one where I said hey Bethesda we've heard that Arcane is working on Prey would you like to comment on this and they said you know what Jason like uh, please don't run this story if you don't run this story because it will really damage us because we're in this negotiation and you should know that like this is really going to have material problems for us. Uh, if you don't run this story, then like we will give you uh, a feature piece where you can talk to all these developers about Arcane and about Prey and like like uh, it will be a lot more interesting than just like a rumor. Um, I would I would think about it. I, I wouldn't make any guarantees or anything, and I would have to talk about my editors. But to me, the value here is informing the reader and serving the reader. And I think that giving people a rumor about a game that's unannounced might be less valuable in the long run than like something that's more in depth and more of a story that they can really sink their teeth into and like get a lot of insight into the development process out of. That said, with games PR, it's always a little dangerous to play that game because sometimes you'll get a lot of PR controlled answers and a lot of just fluff. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be the argument against it. So again, I, I don't think it's something that I've ever had to think about because it's not something that PR people have ever have ever talked to me about. But like, actually, a, a better example might be the system shock thing because like, if 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 Bethesda, if I call Bethesda and say, "Hey, we're about to run this email saying um, Prey is going to come, Arcane's making Prey, and they're inspired by System Shock 3. And Bethesda said to me, "Hey, this could damage our negotiations right now with EA uh, over the System Shock license. But but if you wait, then we'll tell we'll let you tell the behind the scenes story of how we got this System Shock license. That to me might be more compelling." than, than um, the original story. But again, it all depends. There are a lot of factors at play here. And it's something that, again, I would only consider if it was a story that did not like do perform some sort of like real public good that was not about like like um, holding people in power to account, that was not about like um, people's lives being affected in significant ways or being hurt or anything like that like that would not even be up for debate it would only be about those sort of business stories where it, it, i wouldn't like I, hypothetically i didn't think that um sharing this information now was all that necessary that like it could sit it could wait in exchange for something that would be more valuable for readers but again this is not something that i have done before or had to deal with before really um so it's something i would just have to weigh over on a case-by-case -case basis have you ever been to a situation when your opinion or your article or something else related um was a reason to deprive your outlet of the you know of advertisement for a period of time because of the re relations uh, between the outlet and the publisher, for example, and you said something wrong. I have no idea. I've never once thought about advertisements on a site. Fortunately, um, I've worked for outlets where the wall between editorial and advertisement is very strong. So while I was at Kotaku, I was there for eight, eight years or so, a little bit more than eight years. I've never once thought about an ad, been told about an ad, been said anything that has to do with advertisements on the site. Um, I've never once been told like, hey, you can't run this story because they're our advertisers. Mm -hmm. Nothing, absolutely nothing. The only thing that's happened is 
again, Bethesda, um, blacklisted me and Kotaku as a whole um, and just stopped responding to anything we asked them, stopped per, uh, inviting us to any events, um, sending us review copies, anything. Still to this day, um, they've blacklisted me as a result of the arcane story and a couple of other things. Um, but but uh, uh, advertisement I've never even given any thought to. That's an interesting point. I mean, blacklisting is al- almost the same. Uh, but it, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's 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 it affects editorial mm-hmm. more. It's funny, like yeah, that that is the pressure that really affects my job. Like the advertising department has always been both at Kotaku and Bloomberg. It's always been, and any other outlet I've worked for, it's been so distant from me that I don't even give it any thought on a day to day basis. Like it's never even crossed my desk. It's never crossed my mind. Like what the advertisers were doing, other than like seeing an annoying advertisement on the site and being like, God, I wish this would go away. But other than that, like it's never ever had anything to do with me. Um, I got my paycheck no matter what. Um, the editorial pressure, the blacklisting side of things, that's where it actually affects it. And I've been fortunate that, again, I've worked for for companies where we haven't really had to care. And I've never once been told not to run a story. And I've never once chosen not to run a story because I was afraid it would piss off a PR person and like prevent them from ever contacting us again. And over the years, it wasn't just Bethesda. We've had some like off and on relationships with other companies as well. Ubisoft froze us out for a while. Um, some others over the years. Uh, Bethesda is the only one that's been consistent. Like the other ones, I've been able to kind of get on the phone with them and like rebuild relationships. Um, Bethesda's head of PR is the only person who would never get on the phone with me. But um, but yeah, no, it's uh, it's it's an interesting part of the job. It's just something you have to kind of. Uh, deal with is again like I said earlier PR people as a general rule and some game developers just think that press is just there to be part of their marketing mm-hmm. arm and get mad when when the journalists do something that is not aligned with their carefully constructed marketing schedules and it's uh, it's a shame but that's part of the industry that's just something people have to deal with well uh, yeah. I had, imagine a world yeah. where yeah, sometimes I imagine and it's not related to this directly but it's it's uh, just a tangent that comes to my mind like if the world was not relying on ad- advertisers so much for all its business models like you know facebook is relying on advertisement google everything is relying on advertisement it would be such a better world right no, nobody likes advertisement and how and what it does to people i mean i i was looking at it uh, as a part of uh uh, of the responsibility of the journalist, uh, because you know I've been uh, working with the, the independent uh, entertainment media, and it's pretty hard when you have to balance between uh, between the, the the two evils, if I may say so. You have to stay you have to stay true, of course. You have to stay entertaining. You have to stay uh, you know. Um, you have to compete, uh, but at the same time you have to think about how to uh, earn money because you have to pay your authors, your journalists, your tech stuff. You have to buy more and more, uh, you know, computers, cameras, microphones, etc., etc. So once I had a wild story uh, with a uh, with the local uh, office of uh, of a huge uh, publisher mentioned before, and it's not Bethesda. Uh, just to you know, just to make it clear, because there's a lot of Bethesda in this uh, episode. So there was th- uh, that guy, uh, and uh, he was going like, "If you want, if you want to have a contract with my company, you have to do something for free." I mean, hey man, we are. I mean, we are working as uh, as journalists pretty well. We have reviews. We have guides, strategy guides. Uh, Tricks and tricks and all that shit. What do you mean? Uh, we have to do something for free before you give us the the chance to, you know, to run ads with you. And he was like, "No, that doesn't count. You have to do something special, like if something uh, that in a in some different case would be uh, considered uh, an advertising. And then we can talk about." actual advertising and uh, the the money part so we are still well that's not uh, the blacklist thing but we are still we still do not have any relations I mean uh, in the commercial sense of these words that's crazy 
Now loading the house of the dead. So yeah, Raf, you had a you had a rant to make about Metacritic and uh, reviews and scores. Oh, is that this time? Well, I mean, to be it's so interesting to know what Jason thinks. Yeah, I mean, I've been writing for many many years that I think review scores are poisonous and should be abolished. And Metacritic, I actually wrote a large article for Kotaku a few years ago about how Metacritic is uh, Metacritic's many problems for the industry and how harmful it is. So uh, we might be aligned on this one, Raf. Yeah, as as an industry, we, we've the different actors of this industry have co-created a, a, a system, an ecosystem with with the with the the scoring system, the reviews, etc. That is ultimately, uh, yeah, it's pretty toxic, right? And I don't think people even realize when they were doing this initially. Like I, I assume the Metacritic guys, to whom I talked to, by the way, they're very nice people. Uh, when they came in, like was was it in the nineties or something? They just came in and they saw, yeah, it would be a nice idea to just have a site that aggregates all the reviews. And you know, they probably did that as a little passion project that cost them two dollars, and then eventually it became like one of the most influential. Uh, thing ever. I, I, I don't think people realize that games, uh, the, the, the you know, devs as well live and die by the by the review scores, uh, specifically Metacritic, because the, the thing that people need to know is that a lot of uh, publishers will base their bonus schemes on Metacritic. Uh, you know, I'm sure even Metacritic doesn't know that. Uh, if you but are they going do if- by now, it's been public enough for years that uh, that Metacritic is right. aware. By the way, the thing that's really messed up about that is that that's millions of dollars we're talking about with those bonuses, and the people who are submitting review scores to, to Metacritic, I mean, are usually underpaid. Sometimes they're not paid at all. Sometimes it's like volunteer websites, like college students who are like volunteering for their for hobbyist websites so they can get free review copies. And these this is these review scores are what's determining this like multi million dollar bonus. Scheme. So weird. So weird. So wrong. And. And also, so there's there's that part, right, where uh, the, so the publisher also, if, you, if you're a, little, a small developer or, or, or a developer in general and you want to sign a deal with the publisher, the first thing that the publisher will do, I do that too if I want to judge a game. I have Metacritic, how many, you know, how many points this game me? Huh? 6.5, ha <laughs> ha, that's not good, you know. <coughs> what about uh, user score? <laughs> well, if you, yeah, user scores are super extreme, right? It's either like uh, a 10 because it's one. incredible or zero. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so it's kind of like a punishing technique uh, of platform at this point. And uh, I just think it should go away. I think I think the scores themselves should go away, frankly, because it scores make people not read the content of the review. Exactly. If I see a four, I'm not even going to read the thing. I'm just going to say, I'm just going to conclude... The, 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 the reviewer didn't like this game. I don't know that he didn't like it because of this or because of that. So, so you know, and, and also everything... They all nuance. And eliminate all nuance. And speaking of nuance, everything is between 8 and 10. Really. You know, if you if you have anything below that, it means that, that game is not really good. You know, 8 means it's okay, it's polished, uh, it looks good, it doesn't crash, it's playable. <laughs> Nine means well, that's for it's AAA. amazing. Eight means that's really good if it's an indie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's true. But you know, and ten means you must buy. So anyway, if you're out of this, you're screwed, and and we all know that. You know, yeah. People and then like there's always a journalist that say, well, I mean, in my world, a five is actually an average game. It's like, man, I, I get it in your world, but in the world of Metacritic, where your review is going to end, it's going to damage us. Uh, so I think all in all, this this Metacritic thing uh, is is a, is a real problem, and uh, and the scoring in general is a real problem. And I think sometimes it's been to our, to our advantage, you know, and sometimes it's been to uh, not to our advantage. And so I'm just saying in general, it's a, it's it discourages devs to do something interesting and risky because if you want to land on a good eight eight something, you're just gonna make a nice flat. Uh, boring game that is just gonna get its eight. If you're trying to be edgy and like, well, what about if we do this or do that or like maybe a little more risk on the technique, on the te- uh, sorry, on the technology, uh, then you know if you have a few crashes at launch, you're gonna get, you're gonna get like Im- immediately slammed. And here's the thing: 
Metacritic, another little perk of Metacritic is that it keeps the scores forever. It keeps the original score. In a world where we update the games, we, we change everything, it's like, no, it's the first release that counts forever on your game. And that is another thing that I've talked to the guy himself, you know, on the phone, like, you have to explain me this thing. And he, would, he, he, was, he was good at explaining it. He, he went back to the 90s when, indeed, the, 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 the strong publishers would, would put pressure on the, on the journalists to get a good score. And so they did this thing where they said, no, 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 the first score is the right one because there was this phenomenon where a reviewer would not like the game for some, some valid reason. He would give it a seven or a six or whatever. And uh, then the publisher would come back. Hey, this is not fair. You know, are you sure you want your advertisement this month, etc.? They put pressure and then suddenly the review got, got magically up to an eight. And so in good faith, the guy from Metacritic believed that it was unfair to to the to the game to be to to, uh, to it was unfair to the readers uh, to get those skewed reviews based on advertisement power, and so I get his point. You know, it's not that I don't get it, but uh, at the end, it, it probably does in general more bad than good in a world where games are constantly evolving, constantly being readjusted, fixed. Uh, made better, etc. So, most of all, when it comes to technical problems, you know, if the game is great but it has technical problems and you give it like a low score because it's kind of like crazy because then it, it doesn't represent the game how it will be in two months, right? So, anyway, that's my that's my rant. Please, please, Metacritic people, either change your, your, your system or, you know, do something about it because we, we're not friends. Raph, what about if a publisher says to you, hey, you got a $5 million bonus for your studio if you hit uh, an 85 on Metacritic, but then they make your release date so tight that you only have X number of weeks for QA instead of the number, the amount of time you wanted, and so therefore you get an 84 instead of an 85, and then the publisher doesn't have to pay out the, the bonus. Good for lucky them. It's, it's like, it's such a, such a strange system. Is that an obsidian yeah, entertainment and... story? I think I read it <laughs> in Blood, Sweat and no. Pixels. To, uh, I think, I don't want to speak for the people, but uh, I think uh, even Chris Avalon himself uh, mentioned several times, please stop saying that Bethesda did not pay a $1 million bonus because the reality is that they are the ones who offered it. It was not, it was not something we asked for. So they were not counting on it initially. So it, the, the story has been a little anti-Bethesda unfairly, apparently. Uh, to you know, to to what I read from, I read a tweet from uh, from Chris Avalon re, uh, recently saying that. So um, I assume I assume uh, he knows better than any of us. You know. But uh, but yeah, I mean, I'm sure this kind of story has happened in the past because it's uh, yeah, and there's nothing you can really do about it. You can hope that the publisher will be fair at the end of the day. And they they will still compensate you based on some other criteria like sales or whatever. No, I yeah, I wasn't really talking about New Vegas. It's more of a hypothetical. But I but I do want to bring up another point, which is um, I'm entirely in agreement with you, Raphael, and I'm very proud that at Kotaku, the entire time I was there, we never used review scores. I don't know if Kotaku ever used review scores. Um, was very proud of my colleagues at um, Polygon under Chris Plan, who was an excellent I'm editor. Proud of you. Then they also got rid of their review scores. Um, Eurogamer also, uh, my colleagues at Eurogamer decided to get rid of review scores. It's become a very nice trend among some of the game sites. Um, I think that review scores are poisonous for a lot of reasons, not just the ones you mentioned, but also just they kill all attempts at nuance. They make it impossible for a reviewer to like um, try to uh, like articulate that they both loved and hated a game, which is often, often the times with games. Oftentimes you just like have so many conflicting feelings and it's like, oh man, like I loved so many parts of this i hated so many parts of this um destiny is a perfect example that's a game i loved and played many hundreds of hours with but also hated as i was playing a lot of it um and how do you give that game a score it's impossible like totally. okay i'm gonna give this a six because i love it and i hate it it's just yeah, i agree right and the other thing is that it 
it it like it it strips so much nuance that it doesn't allow for games that are polarizing because if a game gets a lot of tens and it also gets a lot of fours then it's described as like a seven um which means it's oh okay it's a seven it's a mediocre game on metacritic but really it wasn't a mediocre game it was a polarizing game it's a game that a lot of people will love and a lot of people will hate which is a lot different than a game that is like the average of all of those scores so yeah there's so many reasons metacritic is broken and it is all so so messed up i have a good example with uh not one of our games actually but uh with uh, vampire bloodlines which i th- personally i think it's one of the best games uh it's it's in my top 10 games ever and i don't know it must have like uh you know it's lucky if he has a 78 percent. i don't know I'm, i make this up but i i, I, re- I recall it's got like a, a pretty pretty sad score uh if, for even though it's definitely one of the one of the most meaningful games to a lot of people, right? But but to your mm-hmm. point, where it, it was probably polarizing, there was probably some tech issues there back then, or it was like amazing, amazing story and dialogue and play motifs with pretty bad level design. Some of it maybe because of technology, you know, there's, there's a variety of reasons, but at the end of the day, in spite of its flaws, it's such an amazing cult uh, game. And it's you know, and I, I'm now I'm gonna have to double check because I just said randomly this this um, uh, this score. I might be wrong about it, but uh, but it, it definitely is lower than it should be. Can you guys, both of you, actually give uh, some advice for uh, for more humble teams for small with smaller games? Uh, I mean. Everybody wants to. Everybody wants some attention, but if you cannot get some, can you go on your own? I mean, can you go? Uh, is it efficient to uh, do your own podcasts or uh, the you know the the dev diaries nowadays? What's your experience of that, Raf? And uh, how do you actually do you pay any attention to this as a journalist, uh, Jason? Well, back in the days uh, where we were, and we were actually in this situation back uh, for Arx Fatalis, our very first game, and uh, we had, uh, yeah, we had zero uh, fame, in mm-hmm. fact, and uh, there was no chance that we would catch any attention. But what we did is before we actually signed a deal, uh, and everybody said, no, you should not do that, you should not contact press until your game is actually official, but we did. We uh, we contacted one blog that was a big fan of the type of games that we are fans of, right? So there was uh, this uh, thing called TTLG. They were doing the Looking Glass stuff. Uh, they were they were big fan of Thief, big fan of Underworld, and uh, I thought I'm gonna send them some pictures of my game. You know, like nobody wants to talk to us, and uh, so we send them we, we send them the, the pictures and the, and a little video of the game. Uh, before it was signed, before before we had a publisher, and the guys went crazy for it. Right? This is this is amazing, um, and uh, and so they, uh, they 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 did like a big article about it. And even though it was a niche thing, you know, because it's a small market, people on the on the on the community there were all like going nuts about it, and uh, that actually uh, snowballed on bigger outlets and eventually we we even made some smaller articles on on pretty big magazines actually back then like written press in fact not even uh um not even on internet we're talking about was a 99 or something uh so that for us paid off but it it took to to target a very very specific blog so uh you're saying that it's important to start uh some pr work even if you are uh, a small studio without the dedicated PR manager or even a you know a PR department. It worked out for us this way. I think uh, I well, think the press uh, and you, you will you will tell me Jason if it's right. I think the press appreciate genuine approach of devs rather than uh, formatted PR with all the press releases. All the nobody reads. Them, yeah, guys. all the press releases. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So I think when a developer speaks they speak their mind they, they're gonna make mistakes they're gonna make they, you know they're gonna be more real and i think i think journalists like that i think the most important part of what raf just said about that story is 
finding the people who are into the type of game that that he is making. I think that's the most important thing you can do as a as a developer who's trying to do PR is like instead of just thinking, you know what, I'm just going to email like tips at Kotaku.com, a press release of my game and hope someone sees it. What you should do is you go on Kotaku and you look at all the authors and you look at the types of games they write about. And if you're making a game that's like an Animal Crossing clone, then you find all the people who uh, you find the, the, the Kotaku writer who is always writing about Animal Crossing and you contact them and you say, hey, I know you love Animal Crossing. Check this out, too. That is one thing that I don't see enough developers doing. People are just kind of just firing off press and PR people. Uh, people are just firing off press releases to everybody when they should be targeting specifically. The best pitches that I get are pitches that are like, hey, Jason, I saw this article. I know you're interested in this. Let's talk about this type of thing that I know you like. Or like, hey, Jason, I know you were tweeting constantly about Phoenix Wright. Well, I'm making a game that's a lot like Phoenix Wright. Check it out. Or hey, Jason, I know you love Divinity Original Sin. I'm making an isometric RPG with systems just like Divinity. Check it out. Or whatever else. Like, like that to me is the most important part of this equation. Because once you find that one journalist who like might be really into what you're doing, then that person will be an advocate for you. And I've done this before where like I was obsessed with an indie game there was a game a couple years ago called cross code that was like so up my alley it was like this super it's a super nintendo style um action rpg with like zelda puzzles and this great story and I loved it to death and I would evangelize it all the time I would tell people people you have to check out this game it's amazing um because I was obsessed with it it was all I could play and I think when you find people who will be passionate in a genuine way about your game that can make a world of difference and so that's really important thanks for your time jason raf it's been a pleasure talking to you nice to meet you jason uh, i hope uh, sometimes when yeah. uh, all this uh, hopefully ends uh, we will meet in person and talk about this more <laughs> yeah thanks for having me and and raf it was a pleasure it was a pleasure chatting as always pleasure, Looking forward pleasure to for me game. too yeah thank you thanks guys bye jason bye bye